Hi, welcome to video number 13 in Food Mechanics. In this video, we're going to be starting section number five, and it's called Dimensional Analysis and Similitude. So we've seen in this course how each new section builds upon the one before it and also introduces a new piece of the puzzle. So we just finished section four, where we looked at inviscid flows. And so we neglected viscosity or the effect of the viscous terms. But we didn't stop and look in more detail like, what does that actually mean? And how do we know if we can do that or not? And how do we know once we neglect the viscous terms, if it's still meaningful or not? We've also had equations where we neglected gravity. But again, we didn't look really closely at whether or not we could neg neglect it or how do we know if we can neglect it. And if we neglect it, are our equations still meaningful? And so that's what we're going to answer in section five here. We're going to use dimensional analysis to do that. And we're also going to see how powerful of a tool this is. So we're going to look at some things like whether or not you can outrun a dinosaur. And we're really going to have a lot of fun with this, I think. So let's get to it. Okay, so here's the breakdown of section five. So we'll start with some non-dimensionalization, talk about the nature of dimensional analysis. And throughout this, because this material is very applicable, I'm going to use sort of as an example, as I'm describing this, the drag force on a sphere. Then we're going to look at what's called the Buckingham Pi theorem. And in a separate video, I'm going to do an example showing how you use the Buckingham Pi theorem to figure out the dimensionless parameters that describe the drag force on a sphere. And I think one of the most important things we're going to finally figure out in this video, I know it's been a, a pressing issue for most of us, is whether or not we can outrun a T-Rex. So normally in class, I'd, I'd take a vote on this. So just think to yourself for a second on whether or not you think you can outrun a T-Rex. And then what we're going to do at the end of this lecture is actually run through the numbers and see if it's possible for a human to outrun a, a T-Rex or not. So we talk a lot about the practical applications of the things we're learning. And in that case, I think it's fairly obvious why it's so important to know if we can outrun a, a T-Rex or not. Arguably most important thing we're going to learn in this lecture, if not the entire course, right? So that'll be an exciting thing to see. All right, but we'll start here with section 5.1. That's non-dimensionalizing the basic differential equations. And what this is going to show us here, this is going to really help us answer the question of how do we know when certain things are negligible or dominant in these equations. So we look here at steady incompressible two-dimensional flow of a Newtonian fluid with constant viscosity. So we've already made a number of approximations there in listing off these equations. And so if you remember back to the beginning of section four, I showed these equations. So the mass balance and Navier-Stokes equations, and these are the differential equations. So what we've done here is, is add a few more approximations to simplify them a little bit, but we're going to use these to take a close look at seeing when we know which of the forces or which of the terms are negligible or not. So at the top there, we have the mass balance after all these approximations are applied. And below that is the momentum balance. So this is a, a further simplified form of these uh, so-called Navier-Stokes equations. And that's a vector equation, so we have the uh, x component and y component listed there. Now, you'll remember for a second that what these are used for is generally when we want point-by-point -point information of the flow. So when we solve these equations, the three variables we have here are u, v, and p. So we basically will be looking at a certain setup and we want to know what the velocity is and the pressure is at each location in this setup. So to solve these, you'd apply boundary conditions and then just the normal uh, partial differential equation solutions that we would have come across previously in calculus. What we're going to do here instead is look at how do we simplify these so we don't have to go through all of that solution process. And I mentioned before, um, very challenging, if not impossible, to get analytical solutions to most cases for these equations, right? We often have to numerically model these. So there's a huge benefit if we can simplify these equations just based on looking at some basic conditions, some basic things we know about the flow. So this might not seem like an example, but actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these equations I'm going to non-dimensionalize them. And so we really can think of this as like an example. I'm going to take these three equations now and walk through how we non-dimensionalize them. And then we'll look at the final result to see when and if we can neglect certain terms in the equation. Okay, so for starters, we pick some reference dimensions. In this case, we're going to use the length scale L and what we'll call the free stream velocity of V infinity that corresponds to our situation. And just, I just want to make sure we know w what these mean in practice, right? So when we say like a reference length scale there, L, for example, if you were looking at 
um, say, the flow over a baseball or a golf ball. Typically, the length scale we care about is going to be the diameter of the ball. Um, if you're looking at a car, for example, maybe the length scale is the length of the car or the height, the height of the car that the flow sees. And this V infinity, for example, when we say free stream velocity, so what that would mean is like if you're looking at a, a golf ball sailing through the air, right, it would be the velocity of the air passing over the ball. Or if you had a car driving, it would be, for example, that speed of the air that's moving over the car. So what we're accomplishing here with these reference dimensions is we want to scale this whole problem so that everything is scaled to these reference dimensions. So I'll show the scalings below here and then we'll talk about that in a little more detail. Okay, so each of these terms here, x star, y star, u star, v star, and p star is the dimensionless version of our variable. So in each case, you can see now x star is x divided by l. So x is in coordinates of meters and l is in coordinates of meters, right? So x star has no dimensions at all. That's what we mean by non-dimensionalizing. So now they have no dimensions. But more importantly, when you think about each of these dimensions now, what we're generally trying to accomplish is have these go from 0 to 1. So, for example, if you were looking at, say, the distance across a pipe, your, your length scale would be like the diameter of the pipe. So your y-coordinate, for example, might go from point of zero to a maximum of, of y being equal to l, right? So it, it runs from roughly from zero to one. So as we scale these, we're trying to keep them, it doesn't have to be exact, but generally from zero to one. Same thing with the velocities there, right? So the velocities might go from a velocity of zero and then they might be a maximum at the free stream velocity there of v infinity. So again, the u star coordinate is going to go effectively from 0 to 1. The pressure one's a little interesting there. And if you sort of pause and look at p star for a second, we're taking whatever the pressure value is in our system. That's what the p is there. And we divide by rho v infinity squared. We can just remember back again to chapter 6. That looks a lot like our dynamic pressure value. So that's how we make sure that we're dealing with a dimensionless pressure there. And it, again, in a lot of situations, will provide us with roughly a 0 to 1 type of a scaling there. And again, it doesn't have to be exactly 0 to 1 because we remember the dynamic pressure was uh, half rho v squared. But you're just trying to get this close. And the reason for that is we want all the terms to have roughly the same magnitude. Okay, now what do we gain from this? I mean, it's not clear at this point, like, have we gained anything at all? Is this really going to make it more simple? So we'll walk through this example. We'll continue on here. And what I'm going to do is substitute these dimensionless versions of our variables back into the above equations. So I'll do a few of the substitutions below here, just quickly going over some of the math. But ultimately, we're going to focus on the results. Like, what do we gain from non-dimensionalizing these equations? So you see those equations above. All the u and v and p and x and y values have dimensions. So what we're going to do is take our equations we wrote here and substitute these in. So I'll show you what uh, one of the substitutions, or actually, let's do two of the substitutions here. I'll show you two of the substitutions, and then we'll just go ahead and sub in the rest. We don't need to do every single one individually. I think you'll get the gist of it by just going over these two. Okay, so this term comes up a few different ways where we have basically the velocity times the partial derivative of that velocity. And I'm going to go ahead and sub in here. So at the side here, I'll just quickly write. You see, we want to sub in for these u's. So when we look at our scaling, the u actually becomes this, and x is this. So anywhere we have a u or an x, we sub in for our new scaled parameter. So we get the dimensionless one in the equation instead. All right, so that's the substitution. Now we're going to simplify that term. And I'll show just a quick reminder on the side here, one of the uh, mathematical expressions we're going to use here. And that relates to these um, partial derivative equations. Okay, so that's true for all derivatives. That's one of our rules of derivatives. When we have the multiplication there, we can split it out as I've just shown. And then we'll take a look at the terms we have here. So that v infinity and that l, those are constants, right? Those are just constants that were parameters based on the um, geometry and scenario that we're looking at, right? So you can take v infinity as a constant, right? What, so then what happens is when you're multiplying those terms, if one of them is a constant, for example, if the v infinity was the c in this case, you just cancel off that one derivative because the constant, of course, is not going to have any change because it's constant. All right, so we rearrange that then, keeping only the one derivative and pulling the constants out in front. 
and we're left with this. All right, so I mentioned I'm not going to do all the substitutions, but we can see how if you did do them all, they'd simplify in a similar way. So I've done, for example, this one here, and then each time we have that, we're going to write this substitution instead. Now we're going to look at one more. We'll do a second order differential and see what that substitution would look like. So I'm going to pick this one here and write it out below. Okay, so anytime we have one of those second order differentials, we substitute in for what's shown here. So this guy becomes this guy. And important to remember why we write the second order differentials that way. So it's really important to take a look at the way I sub this in here because you have the squared here. So the only way to keep the dimensions consistent is to make sure we remember uh, at the bottom that L is squared there. Okay, so thus far we've really just introduced a new set of scaled variables, sub them all in. So I'll show the result on a new slide here. So before I move on, I'll just show like a quick reminder of how this substitution worked. So this guy here, for example, got subbed in there. So it really is important we don't get lost in the mathematics here. There's a lot going on. But effectively, we're just subbing these things in. So that's, that's that term there where we also had the density multiplied out front. And then these are still a bit of a mess. So what we do is we simplify them further and then write them as we have here below. So the mass balance is equal to zero. So what we did there is just divide out the V infinity over L terms. For the momentum equations below that, we divided by rho V infinity squared over L. So we're just basically grouping all the like terms together. Okay, now this is really where we see the magic of dimensional analysis. So we've non-dimensionalized these equations. And what happened here was, so, so now each of the terms in this equation is dimensionless. And we've set it up so everything is sort of roughly going between 0 and 1. So when we look at these terms here, we expect them to be roughly the same size. And they're all dimensionless. Okay, now a few of these terms have coefficients in front of them, right? And so these coefficients are now going to tell us the magnitude of each of these terms. So I'll erase what we wrote here for clarity, and then I'll circle one of these coefficients so you can see exactly what I mean. And upon inspection, we look at that a little bit. I'll just give you this one second here to see if you can figure it out. See, what, that, what is that term right there? We've seen this grouping before, so pause it if you want to take an extra second to figure it out. That's one over the Reynolds number. That's just the inverse of the Reynolds number, right? Aha, so now we see all, so all we had to do was substitute in here dimensionless parameters for each of our variables. And now we see beautifully this equation, right? With that coefficient, it shows us that when we have a case where Reynolds number is very big, that makes the coefficient very small because the Reynolds number is in the denominator. So if it's big, then that coefficient will be very small. And if that coefficient is small, that means this whole term here is small. So that's, that's an indication of when we can neglect this viscous term here, right? So that's why in the previous chapter, we said, well, which cases are inviscid? What, what does that mean? What does that even mean, neglecting viscosity, right? Well, now we can see when Reynolds number is high, that term is just going to be small mathematically, right? So we can get rid of it. Conversely, though, conversely, if you have a Reynolds number that's very, very small, that coefficient is going to be quite large. Now, if that coefficient is large, the exact opposite is true, right? Now, that term becomes the most important term, and we can neglect the other terms because we could also simplify this equation. Instead of writing that coefficient as 1 over Reynolds, we could just multiply the whole thing by the Reynolds number. So then all the other terms would be multiplied by Reynolds number. Now, it we would notice that any time Reynolds number was small, those terms would be insignificant or negligible, right? So this is where I've left the space below. You can be writing out what I'm saying here. I'll give you a quick summary. So write something like this. And we've already had a chance to see how nice it is to do that. So when you neglect those viscous terms there and their second order differentials, we actually end up with cases that we can solve analytically and we get a really good understanding of how our systems behave, particularly the pressure uh, related to the velocity behavior. Now in the y direction, so we've set this problem up so that gravity was only occurring in the y direction. So we aligned y with our gravity vector. And we see this other term here. So there's this one additional coefficient. So now that answers our other question, right? Actually, many times in office hours or in class, I was asked, oh, how can we neglect gravity? Like, how do we know when we can neglect it? Well, just take a look at that term. So if you have g times l over v infinity squared, right, if that term is large, you're going to need to include the gravity forces. And if that term is very small, you can neglect the gravity forces.
Now we'll look at an interesting case for both of these just as like a thought exercise. So some of my research work is in microfluidics and nanofluidics. So very small scale system. Now take a look at that gravity term, for example. So I want you to think for a second, in my work is gravity, are those gravity forces going to be important? And we can understand this just by looking at that term, right? So I have very, very small length scales. So my L's are gonna be tiny. And if my L's, for example, are down at the micro scale times 10 to the minus six, it's highly unlikely that I'm ever gonna have any gravity forces that are gonna matter, right? Let's also look at the Reynolds number. So that's one over Reynolds number. So Reynolds equals rho V infinity L over mu, right? So in looking at that case, am I gonna expect big or small Reynolds numbers, right? Well, when you look at that, again, that length scale's on the top there. So in my microfluidics or nanofluidics flows, I'm gonna have extremely small Reynolds numbers. So in my case, I can't neglect the viscous forces when my Reynolds numbers are so small. In fact, my Reynolds numbers are so small that that term is the only term that matters because one over Reynolds is so large, it dominates all the other terms, right? So in my case, you only consider the viscous effects. These are called viscous dominated flows. We also call those Stokes flows. Okay, so I'll summarize that below here, but you can, of course, don't just copy what I'm writing out. Um, just have some summary of your own below there that makes sense to you, right? So we get that benefit of the self-initiated note-taking. Okay, so the final point here as we wrap up this example here is it's possible to do this for any number of equations. So you'll see when you take heat transfer, you're also going to go through an analysis like this that tells you, you know, exactly how you can expect when certain things can be neglected or not in a heat transfer problem, right? So anytime you have these differentials, which is pretty much everywhere in, in mechanical engineering, right? Anytime you have that, you can always non-dimensionalize. And non-dimensionalizing gives you these parameters. Now, of course, you don't have to do it from scratch every single time, right? This has been done before. So we already knew about the Reynolds number and the gravity coefficient before we started this example. But it's really important in many cases to be able to non-dimensionalize. Now, that being said, it's not in every case that you're going to necessarily have the governing equations, nor are we going to want to do this, right? I think many of you are going to be a little bit off put by having to march through this mathematics, right? And that's fine. That's fine. We don't have to do it every time. So what we're going to look at in section 5.2 and 5.3 here is how we can get dimensionless groupings for problems that we're looking at without going through the governing equations. This is also the strategy we're going to use when we look at the T-Rex, for example, and figure out if we can outrun a T-Rex or not. We're gonna look at the parameters involved instead of the governing equations. So in section 5.2 here, we're first gonna take a look at dimensional analysis to see how we use it and what it gives us and develop a bit of understanding first about like where these parameters come from and how we come up with them. And the example we're gonna use throughout this is the drag force on a sphere. So the question we're asking here and what we're looking for is to figure out what parameters are important for the drag force on a sphere. And when we say drag force on a sphere, like sphere, you know, with air traveling over it. So this would be things, right, like the baseball case or the golf ball case or, you know, dropping a, a sphere into a fluid bath, for example. So basically, anytime you have a sphere moving through a fluid, right? Okay, so normally in lecture, you know, I'd, I'd pose the question, what parameters are important for drag force on a sphere? So take a moment here. The answer is, you know, right in front of us there. But take a moment here to make sure this makes sense to you, right? This is sort of like engineering 101 again, right? So being able to figure out, sit there and figure out like what, what is going to matter when you have a sphere traveling through the air? Like what are all the possible things that are going to influence the drag force that that sphere feels? So from the air traveling over it, it's causing this drag force. Now, what are the things that can influence that? So we've got it written out there. So capital F, that's the drag force. Right, and then we say equals F, so that's just saying it's a function of, and we're saying it's a function of a few things here. So, and this, again, you can pause it, right, and try to figure it out for yourself, like what are all the things that can possibly change the drag force that this sphere is gonna feel from the air? And I'll go through them one by one now. So D, so the first one's diameter, right? The size of the sphere, that, that makes sense to us. Of course, the size of the sphere should matter, right? In terms of how much drag force it feels. What's the next one? V, so velocity. So how fast the sphere is traveling through the fluid, that also intuitively should make some sense to us, right? 
So how fast it's moving is going to influence the drag force. And the final two relate to the type of fluid, right? So of course, if you're traveling in a thicker fluid or a liquid, for example, versus air, you're going to feel a much different drag force. So we're looking there at the density of the fluid and of course the viscosity of the fluid as well, because fluids with the same density might have very different viscosities. And we know that that's also going to influence how much drag there is or resistance there is to the sphere traveling through it. Okay, now as engineers, we want to know what influences the drag on this sphere because we're designers. So in some cases, we might want to make sure the sphere can travel through the air as easily as possible, right? So golf ball, for example, but also if you're cooling ball bearings in a bath, right? And you want to have them quickly flow to the bottom of a fluid bath, like we need to know how to design them. Should they be big or small or what should the density of the fluid be? All of these things. It's really important for us to know. Also the drag on a sphere, we've seen that relates to a lot of other shapes as well. So getting a fundamental understanding of this helps us design how to make sphere like objects move through the air. There might be cases also where we want there to be a lot of drag. So if we then want to figure out, okay, okay, so exactly how does the diameter, for example, influence the drag force? Well, you can set up a series of experiments, right, where you use a whole bunch of different sized spheres, so you change the diameter, and then measure the drag force. But then the problem is you could only set, you know, one velocity and one type of fluid for that experiment. So you have to rerun that experiment now with a whole bunch of different velocities, right? And then you have to rerun that experiment again with a whole bunch of different fluids. And each time you have to do all the velocities, all the different diameters, and you can start to see this would be incredibly tedious. There's really no possible way you could get a picture of the drag force on a sphere if you have to measure, you know, a huge range of values for each of these parameters. There's just too many. But lucky for us, the drag force is not independent a function of all these parameters. What happens is we can actually use this analysis we're going to learn in this chapter to determine exactly how many terms the drag force is a function of. So we're going to see this in an example, but we'll just go through it now to enlighten us for what's going on here. So we'll actually end up in the case of the drag force on a sphere with only two dimensionless parameters. So it turns out that it's not independently the diameter or the velocity that matters. It turns out that it's this rho v d over mu term. That's the grouping that matters. And that relates to a dimensionless force on the left there. But you won't be able to figure out exactly. So this f denotes that this dimensionless drag force and this term on the right here, it's a function of it. But you'll still have to run experiments to figure this out. But what's going to happen is if you've chosen all the parameters that matter, once you have this dimensionless grouping, you'll only have to vary that one dimensionless grouping. So you can see, for example, to get a whole bunch of different values of rho v d over mu, you could just have one setup with one fluid and, for example, change the velocity, right? Which is, that's generally the easiest way to go for these experiments. Now, again, I mentioned it's, it's, we really need to have examples of this. So for now, we'll see these two parameters and we'll look at this curve below to see what this means. So generally, if you want to know that you got all the parameters that matter, when you run these experiments, you're going to have, no matter what different size of spheres you use, as long as you have that rho v d over mu term, and let's pause for a second, I think some of you might have notice this, right? Rho V D over mu is, is, is what? Right. It's just the Reynolds number, right? Where instead of L for the length scale, you've subbed in diameter here. So in this case, all you're going to need to do is do these experiments and vary the value of Rho V D over mu. So let's look at the plot below. This is a whole bunch of experiments, right? And instead of doing millions of experiments to cover all of the values, all you need to do is do an individual experiment. So each of these data points here shows completely different sphere diameters, sets of data that were run in completely different labs by different people. And you can see no matter what's happening here, every value of that Rho V D over mu corresponds to a single value value of the force on the y-axis there. And so you know you've done it correctly because you end up, no matter what all these data points are with a little bit of scatter, you just have this one line here, right? All, everything follows that line. And now you might be thinking, for example, well, how do I know? How do I know I didn't miss something, right? How do I know the drag on a sphere, there aren't other things that matter? Well, the answer is actually because you ran these experiments and they all fall along that one curve. So that means you have considered everything that matters here. If you were going to have a huge scatter all over the place and they didn't fall on one curve, then there, that would indicate to you that there was something you're forgetting to include. So there would be something else that matters, right? But if you know you have this beautiful curve like this here, then you've considered all the functionality. And now when you think about this, what's phenomenal, right, is all you need to do. So any sphere you have, 
have, right? As a designer now, you, you might have your sphere. It might have a certain diameter and there's a certain velocity and there's a fluid it's traveling through. So all you need is that rho V D over mu, which you're going to have from your design of your sphere. So you calculate a number for that. You look at this curve below. Let's say your number's here. You just go there. And now that corresponds to a drag force on the left axis. So you can figure out exactly what the drag force is on your sphere. Okay. And that's really powerful. You'll also notice in this plot, the Y axis there, it's not exactly the same as what's here. There's a multiplication done there. And we'll discuss as we march through section five, why that's done. But that's because that's the drag coefficient actually. And so that's really powerful, right? As we look at this, we can see now, this is basically an explanation of why we would want to use dimensional analysis and how powerful it can be. But again, I can appreciate like, this is a challenging thing to digest for the first time. So I'm going to walk through in more detail and we're going to do more examples and we're going to really see this through. So, you know, how do we get those dimensionless terms? And how do we generate a plot like this, right? So we're going to march through now and look at a few examples. But what this initial section has done here is to indicate to us just how valuable, just how important this can be. So in section 5.3 here, we're going to move on to what's called the Buckingham Pi theorem. And this is how we're going to figure out how do we figure out what these dimensionless groupings are? How do we get that, right? How do we know how many there are and how do we figure out how to do it? So that's what we're going to look at now. Okay, so as we learn the Buckingham Pi theorem here, Again, it's really best if we just walk through this with the example. So let's use the drag on a sphere as we walk through this. So for starters there, we know that the force, right? The first line there, the force is going to be a function of those four variables that we just described. So the size, the fluid properties and the velocity, right? Now knowing that, so we can rewrite this equation and basically say, so there's five variables we'd want to know. We just rewrite that and set them equal to zero. So G is just some unspecified function. So we're going to rewrite that in general terms here so that we can figure out exactly what the Buckingham Pi theorem is stating. So instead of writing these variables here, we can write them as these little Q's with the subscripts. G is some unspecified function. So all of those little Q's are all the actual variables in real life, in real practice that we have, right? So things like size, velocity, fluid properties, forces, etc. right? And what Buckingham Pi is going to let us do is go from all of those individual forces and sizes and parameters where we have a number of them from one up until N there, right? In the sphere case, like N would be five. And what we want to do is go to the capital G line below where each of those pi terms is now a dimensionless grouping. And the number we're going to have there is now N minus M. Or we can rewrite this again, like we did above is to say that one main grouping is equal to a number of the other groupings. And the value in that, that we just saw in section 5.2 is you take a whole bunch of them, like five of them, like we have in the case of the sphere. So you go from that higher number to the lower number. So in the case of the sphere, we went from five to two. So what Buckingham Pi tells us is now we're going to end up with N minus M as our number of parameters. So we went from N to N minus M, where M is usually the minimum number of independent dimensions you need to define your problem. So what are the dimensions? Those are things like mass, length and time, right? So typically that is three mass, length and time are the three that we need. And so to keep us grounded in the practical sense, right? Like what we had was for the sphere, we had N equals five, our M equals three. We're going to see this in a more detailed example, but I'll just quickly mention this for now. Mass, length and time. So we ended up with five minus three, which was two, right? So we went from five total variables and then we said, hey, really, there's only two. There's actually only two variables that matter. All right. So that's the power, right? Going from this five, right? We think it's a function of these five things, but it's really not. It's really only a function of two things, which is what enables us to do experimental analysis, to design these things, to be engineers, to understand it, right? Okay. So what does this look like? Well, we have our sphere with five. We can write it either in the G way or pulling out the function we're concerned with, which is drag force. So we'll write it this way or this way. And then once we apply the Buckingham Pi analysis, which we will do, I'll do this detailed example. But for now, we see we end up with these two parameters like this, or we can rewrite it on the right like this. And then this little guy here, that just means, you know, is a function of or has some functionality. And what is that functionality? Well, that's where the experiments come in. And that's the plot above has given us that functionality. So there's really only two parameters now that matter. There's only two things that it's a function of. And so that makes our lives a lot easier.
One final note here before we go on to figuring out how to get these pi groups, right? Making sure we're connecting with these concepts is when you make these dimensionless groupings, these pi terms, they have to be independent. So what's shown here, right? If you have these terms here where there's a possibility to write them as like some combination of all the other terms. Okay, so if you have something like this or this where that pi term can be written like the others, no, that's wrong. They're not pi terms. So all the pi terms you find must be independent. Okay, so how do we get these? How do we get these groupings now? That's what Buckingham Pi tells us, but we are engineers. We want to know how to calculate these things. These are the steps, and then I'm going to do an example where I refer to each of these steps. Okay, step one, list all the dimensional parameters involved. So I can say here generally that you shouldn't worry too much about that. As you get more experienced in doing this, you will get a sense for which parameters are involved. And generally speaking, if there's any doubt, just include it, right? It's better to include it than not include it. And then eventually when you go to the experiments, it'll be clear which of the terms matter and which really don't. Step two, select a set of fundamental or primary dimensions. Generally, you're going to be dealing with a mass, length, and time. So that's MLT or potentially force length and time. Less common, but also used. T is written as the lowercase t there because it denotes time, whereas not in this course, but obviously, you know, we've talked about how this is applicable to heat transfer as well. You'll see quite a bit of this in heat transfer. Um, so in that case, you might need capital T, which is going to represent temperature there. Step three is we're going to list them all. And as I mentioned, I'm going to I'm going to do a few examples of this. So don't worry. We'll even go through in the one case. Uh, what do the experiments look like? Then step four, we'll see this again in the example, is you select a set of R dimensional parameters, dimensional so like the ones from step one, right? Where the R refers actually to repeating and that these have to include all the primary dimensions. So like the mass and length and time. And we're going to have to make sure that we don't have any parameter that has dimensions that are power of another one. But the example will make it clear what that means. Step five, we then set up our dimensional equations. We combine all the parameters in step four with each of the other parameters, and then we'll form our dimensionless groups. At this point, I don't think you'll you'll see what this means in the example. I don't I don't think it's uh, it's going to be clear right now, but we'll do the example. Then you can come back. It's nice to have this list here. Not super sure how meaningful this is right now. We'll get to the example now. So step six is just check to see that each group obtained is dimensionless. So let's just go do that now. Uh, it's nice to have this list, but then the examples are going to make it clear. And just one more point here. If so, the Buckingham Pi tells us we go from some n number of dimensions and then we get down to only being n minus m, right? So what is important to remember is if that n minus m equals one, meaning there's only the one dimension. So it means that whatever you're looking at is only a function of actually this one thing. So what that means is if you only have something that's a function of the one dimension, there are no other dimensions, then it has to be a constant right? There's, there's uh, nothing to plot. So we know in that case that single pi term must be a constant. So I've been putting the examples into separate videos, but I think as you've seen in this video, it's really important to have the examples and the material side by side. They're integral to each other. Like it's difficult to understand the concepts without an example right there. So what I'll do in this case is I'll do one example with the sphere in a separate video, but I want to do this dinosaur example like as part of this lecture video because I think they really go hand in hand in this case. It really helps with the understanding. All right, this is a question that I've assigned in the past to my uh, graduate course in microfluidics. That's why it's listed as question 10 there. Yeah, assignments can get <laughs> quite large in grad school. So I got them to do this and now I'm going to do this as an example for you. So Jurassic Park would have you believe that the Tyrannosaurus Rex is very fast. They're trying to escape it in a Jeep, right? Let's take a look at that here. Must go faster. Okay, so you get the sense for like, maybe you'd have a, a tough time outrunning a Tyrannosaurus Rex, but how can we actually figure this out? So what's really interesting is someone took a look at this in the past and we have some data. So from the fossil record, we have data on the hip height, right? So we can look at the bones and figure out the hip height for the dinosaur and the stride length. 
right? And we also know that gravity is important for this, g. And of course, we're solving for velocity, right? So we know there are four parameters that matter, hip height, stride length, gravity, and velocity. Now again, as I mentioned before, like it's not always clear which ones of these you need to pick. But what, what's fascinating and what's cool about this example I'll do here is I'll actually show you the experiments, right? Where you can actually see if the correct selection of parameters was chosen or not. And it's worth noting here, there is a bit of a, a debate amongst researchers. Some people think you should include mass and others don't. And by the end of this question, you know, I think I'll let you decide. So for part A, it says, what is or are the dimensionless parameters for this problem? Show your work. Okay. So this is a Buckingham pie analysis. So believe it or not, our dimensional analysis is going to be able to show us if we can outrun Tyrannosaurus Rex or not. So first things first, we figure out how to correlate the speed that an animal runs to these different lengths we have. So it's hip height, basically the length of its legs, its stride length, and gravity. So let's go ahead and do that and see what happens. Okay, we read out the parameters. They're actually given to us. So hip height, stride length, velocity, and gravity. We need to pick our dimensions here. We'll notice we're only actually going to need length and time. So we write each of our parameters out in terms of these dimensions. So this is a great example of how we, we pick the repeating ones now. So remember I said don't pick the one that you're trying to solve for. So in this case, it's velocity is the one we care about, right? That's what we call the dependent parameter. So don't pick that one, right? That leaves us with, we only need one of the length scales here. So let's pick H. That gets us the length dimension. And then to get time, we have to pick G because we can't pick U, right? So that made our choice actually fairly straightforward. So Buckingham Pi tells us how many equations we're going to need. N is 4, right? M equals R equals 2. We only have a length and a time. So N minus M equals 2. We're only going to have two dimensionless parameters that matter. Okay, let's figure out what they are. So we'll do pi 1 here. The ones we didn't pick are the stride length and the velocity. So for pi 1, let's do stride length. Okay, that one's not too bad. We can solve that one uh, pretty easily, almost by inspection, really. Okay, now the second one. So we solve for the exponents now. Or it's dimensionless, so we are free to square the top and bottom if we choose. So we can also write it like this. And that's our second one there. Okay, now is this really interesting question, right? On like, did we get it correct? Did, did, did these parameters actually correlate? Is this actually what the animal's speed is based on? Now what's fascinating is, I'll scroll up here to this plot and we'll look at part B. So part B says, a plot was generated using these dimensionless parameters. So it's from a study I got in Nature here by R. Alexander in 1976. So what he actually did was he, you can actually take data for a whole bunch of different animals on the planet. So he's got here um, jerds, horses, like there's a whole bunch of different animals. And it turns out when you actually look at their dimensionless stride length, so lambda over h, and you plot it against u squared over gh. We see from this plot, this top plot here in part a, I'll just show you. So the data falls pretty much along a, a, a straight line there, right? And what's interesting too is, so some of these, um, like the humans are bipedal, so two-legged, and quadrupeds, things like horses, and they, he used a lot of different sizes, right? So um, mice, so small creatures, large creatures. So it's actually pretty amazing to see that they all fell along this curve. And now that's what indicates to you that you've selected the correct parameters, right? So he actually did these experiments. Now the plot below is also interesting. That's the same type of thing, but he took a whole bunch of different humans. So males, females, babies, adults, 
and had them walk and run at various different speeds along the beach. And he, he used the beach because he can actually, it's quite easy to measure the stride length there. You can see, you know, the point where the, the feet are hitting the sand. And you look at that data, fairly convincing too that that's falling along a, a pretty tight straight line there. So we can see these just by looking at these two dimensions, we could imagine that something like a dinosaur would behave the same way all these other animals on the earth have behaved. So going back to the fossil record, we can actually find, right, hip height, get a great approximation for that. But also, you can actually, in some cases, see the different two different footprints of where the Tyrannosaurus rex was walking. And so that's how we can get a stride length, right? So considering that from the fossil record, I've listed there a common stride length would be something like three meters, uh, hip height. Again, it varies based on the animal, but they found for the ones near where they had the stride length of three meters, the hip height was roughly two meters. So we can actually just use this data from the fossil record in this plot here to figure out the speed. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's actually show how exactly we use a dimensional analysis. I think it's pretty cool for us to do a, a full example here with numbers and everything. So I'm gonna scroll down and then solve it and then scroll back up to this plot in a second. Okay, so we'll do the T-Rex first. So the first dimensionless parameter was our stride length, lambda over H we figured out, pi one, and that's three meters over 2.1 meters. That's 1.43. So now we need to throw that into the plot. Let me scroll back up. Okay, so stride length is plotted on the left here. So we see from one and two there. I'll erase this so it's more clear. Okay, so I would say 1.43 is right around here. So if we correlate that to the dashed line, to value on that axis, I said that's approximately 0 0.14. Okay, let's go down and use that and sub it in. So the plot tells us, therefore, from what we just calculated, it says that the u squared over the gh for that stride length value is approximately equal to 0 0.14. So now we need to sub in for u, therefore, u is going to be square root of 0 0.14 times 9.81 meters per second squared times hip height, which we had as 2.1 meters. That gives us a value, let's list that as T for T-Rex, speed 1.7 meters per second. Not particularly fast, there are many different ways we can get human speed, right? Whether we wanna choose like Usain Bolt's like track speed, or we wanna just look at an average, we can uh, plug in some generic numbers and, and use our plots again the same way we did. So it's sort of a fair comparison. So for a human that's running, again, feel free to go ahead and sub in your own numbers here or whatever you like. This is just, I'm just doing this as an example. Stride length of 2.2 meters. It'd actually be a pretty cool exercise to have everybody go to a beach and like do this and see what their numbers are. Uh, hip height, let's say 1.1 meters. It's kind of cool to think how, what this is actually saying too, right? So that would be a lambda over h of two. Let's go to the plot here. I think it's neat to do this. Let's do this in green. So you can actually see like a longer stride length relative to your hip height. So what it means is like, you're actually going faster if this number is bigger, right? So you could imagine like when you think back to those amazing runs for those 100, 100 meter sprinters, right? Like they have huge long stride lengths. So that, that kind of makes sense to us, right? So we'll take the value at two there. So our u squared over gh value this time, let's say that's like, uh, that's a log scale, right? So that's probably about 0 0.6, let's say, or thereabouts. Right, it's neat to see, right? Like if your stride length was longer and you were like running, you could be potentially out here, you know, you'd have much longer strides. Let's just use this as our generic value for now. Okay, so that uh, was our u squared over gh, approximately, let's say, 0. 0.6. Therefore, u equals the 0. 0.6 times 
meters per second squared times what was our height? 1.1 meters. Might be meters squared per second squared. So units check out. So you, let's say, of human, 3.4 meters per second. All right, so what's the conclusion from this? You can definitely outrun a T-Rex. Not what you were expecting, right? Okay, and let's talk about this, right? That's incredible. That's incredible power of this dimensional analysis, right? Is looking at what variables actually matter and then taking things you can actually measure among creatures where you could never possibly get the velocity, right? So cool. So cool to see all these different creatures that fall along this single curve. It's really powerful when you simplify everything down to the core dimension. So these, these pi terms, these dimensionless groupings that actually matter, it's, it's incredibly powerful, right? Um, other things to think about when you're analyzing this, for example, um, the fossil record, right? Like it's possible, and if you look at the movie, it might be neat to sort of see like what is the stride length on the Tyrannosaurus they show in the movie and what's the, that dinosaur's hip height. And so if you were able to sort of look at what the movie thinks the stride length would be, maybe it would be traveling faster, right? Or maybe if the fossil record showed you had stride lengths where the footprints were very far apart, it might show that the T-Rex actually was capable of traveling faster. But some of this debate is around, you know, some people say the T-Rex was actually a scavenger or, right? We don't actually know the for sure answer to some of these questions. So an analysis like this is really fascinating, right? So I mean, don't quote me on that, right? Like if you see a T-Rex, I, I suggest you do run and hide as, as fast as you possibly can. But I mean, at least you have a chance, right? Like what this analysis shows is from, from what we know about T-Rexes, it's certainly possible for humans to outrun them. So I think that's a really cool way to show how the power of this dimensional analysis, right? We're engineers, so we need things to be practical. So that's where I'm going to stop for this lecture. So a summary of this lecture, basically we looked at how you can actually non-dimensionalize those governing equations and that's how you figure out which of the forces matter. So do the viscous forces matter? Do the gravity forces matter, right? All you had to do was non-dimensionalize that based on some generic um, sort of length scales and velocity scales you had for your problem, right? Then we looked at, you know, the power of a dimensional analysis focusing on the drag over a sphere and really ended up looking at how do you figure out from all these different variables that might matter, what are the real groupings? What is the real dependence of these problems? And you can see there are these neat little dimensionless groupings that mean that you don't have to plot, say, all five variables. You only really need two of them, right? Making these things very possible to do experimentally. Okay, now for the examples, I strongly recommend that you go and watch example 5.1 right now, where I use Buckingham Pi and show how to get the dimensionless groupings for a sphere, very connected to this material that we just covered. And then we looked at a really neat case of Tyrannosaurus Rex. We figured out the pi terms to calculate its velocity based on some of the parameters we think that it might be a function of, figured out which two parameters were most important, were the key ones to describe this problem, and then looked at some actual experiments that were done that types of things that we could actually see ourselves doing to figure out if you can outrun a T-Rex or not. Conclusion, yeah. Humans can probably outrun T-Rex. But again, don't, don't hold me responsible for that. I'm, I'm not taking any responsibility for that. The responsibility is on you if you um, get eaten by a T-Rex. And that's all for video number 13. Bye-bye, Rar.